Once your blood runs orange and blue, orange and blue. 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 this, this is, the pod, is the pod for you. For you. You're listening to Orange and Blue Bloods, hosted by EJ Stewart and Tommy Beer. Let's get to it. New York. So let's get on to Bradley Beal because this has become a thing that is unfolding as we speak. So, um, A, you have the Adrian Wojnarowski report that happened just uh, today that the uh, Wizards are working with Bradley Beal, who has a no trade clause on his contract, to see if he should be somebody. Uh, it should be to, that is to see if if they could find a place for him to be be uh, to, to be traded to. Um, Bradley Beal, of course, a three time All Star, a guy who's accomplished a lot in this league regarding individual uh, accolades, not so much team accolades. He's been staying, he's been stuck in watching a bad situation for most of his career. It seems like the Wizards are saying. At this point in time, if slash when, because they're going to decide this, <laughs> when they decide to rebuild this thing, they're going to try to ship him out. And they are talking to his representatives to figure out a place for him. And then you had Alan Hahn, who uh, is, you know, MSG analyst, uh, does a pregame for the Knicks. I thought it was interesting because he was on ESPN's Get Up. And before Woj comes with this stuff today, and Shams is also piggybacking these reports today by Bradley Beal, he comes out yesterday. And says that the Knicks should be a team that goes after Bradley Beal. And that pairing him with Jalen Brunson uh, would take the Knicks to the next level. So now you got Bradley Beal, like I said, a three-time All-Star who has suffered through some injury-riddled seasons the past four years. Uh, he failed to play more than 60 games during that period. He's also owed more than $200 million over the next four years. But now appears to be on his way out of D.C. and at least one prominent Knicks commentator saying that the Knicks should be a team to go after. So when I see that, Tommy, like I can't help but say, okay, that's interesting to me because is that coming from an educated guess or some kind of surmise of what the front office is thinking, or is this Alan Hahn just shooting from the hip, seeing something as, you know, he wants to see it. So I ask you, should the Knicks go after Bradley Beal? No. Um, mm. uh, you know, long story short, you know, there's uh, 207 million reasons why um, the Knicks should, <laughs> yeah. should avoid, uh, you know, and then the, for um, the uh, next four years of, of Bradley Beal's contract, um, 46.7 million he'll make next year, year after that, 50.2 million. 53.6 million and then at 2026 27 when Bradley Beal I believe will be 34 years old during that season um will make over 57 million dollars um again it's something we've talked about quite often the new CBA um with that with what's called the second apron or it's going to be referred to as a lead apron um it basically puts you over the tax um really limits your ability to round out the roster um and improve your team on the margins um when you, when you exceed that that threshold um and that would bump the Knicks right up against it by trading for Bradley Beal and again I'm not that's not even uh, the way I look I like to look at when when we see a big name being traded whether it's Carl Anthony Towns or rumors you know about a, a guy requesting a trade is if that player was a free agent this offseason would you sign him to the contract he's currently signed for so would right. you pay 207 million dollars for the next four years of bradley beal some teams would and, and would be a decent investment i i personally um you know a, a guy that was never a great defender on the wrong side of 30 um has played for a team that hasn't won more than 35 games in the last four years um, you know, is, is, has seen his efficiency decline a little bit, has seen the scoring average um, dip a little bit. Um, there's just not a lot there in the right situation. It, obviously, the injury history um, is, is not overly encouraging. In the right situation, if you have LeBron and AD or if you have Jimmy Butler and Bam, um, and you think you're one piece away from a title team within the next couple of years, and that's kind of your window, um, and you have some you know, cap that you want to send out, um, then that that's something you, you, you know that, that you might you know be comfortable doing. For me personally, right. from the Knicks standpoint, um, that's not a contract I'm comfortable with. Now, that's the that's a, a question if he was a free agent. Now you're talking about trading him. Uh, also keep in mind he has a 50% trade trade kicker. Um, he's one of the very few players in the NBA with a no trade clause, so the Knicks would have to take back that, that trade kicker amount. Um, and you'd have to send out assets, presumably. Um, you know, first round draft picks, IQ, OB, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever that case might be. Um, I'm sure the Wizards are going to ask for that type of stuff initially. Hopefully somebody bites. Um, again, for me, if the Wizards were uh, potentially you know, send back, you know, draft capital and then you to entice to get off that books and kickstart the rebuild. And that's something I look at. But I'm not willing to give up valuable assets for the right to overplay a 30 year old Bradley Beal, me personally. 
Yeah, I know. I think I think you're right on uh, the right track here. Uh, I I don't want Bradley Beal on the New York Knicks. Bradley Beal to me is like a very interesting NBA figure. I think his career arc, and maybe will be different if he ends up landing on a title contender. But to me, he's like this generation's world be free. Like a guy who scored a lot of points and it didn't really make any impact on the NBA regarding how many points he was scoring. Like, uh, you know, we made the all-star game once be, uh, for world be free. Uh, Beals made it three times. Um, good player. Everybody knows the guy is an offensive uh, offensive uh, scorer, a guy who can definitely put the ball in the hole. But like you said, undersized. I don't like to fit with him and Brunson because now you're talking about two undersized guards. Neither of them can defend. We saw what happened when the Knicks put a, you know, a, a, a backcourt mate next to Brunson who couldn't defend in Fournier. And that was an absolute disaster defensively. So you're going to, you know, do that again. I, I don't, I don't think that that would make sense. Offensively you score, I think, but I don't know. Beal is a guy who's a little ball dominant. So like, it, is he the next, is he the great fit next to Brunson? Now can he adjust his game? Maybe be a little bit more of a spot up shooter guys, maybe more uh, off ball guy. I guess, but he's really good in pick and roll. Like I think that like it's actually underrated how much of a threat he is playing in that pick and roll style. It was one of the reasons why him and John Wall kind of clashed a little bit because the Wizards' offense is actually better when they were running their offensive field at some at certain points than Wall. So am I gonna take Brunson moving off the ball a bunch? I don't really want to do that either. So I, I don't like the fit, and that goes beyond even just talking about the money, you know, and the injuries. Beal's been a guy who's been injury prone, like you said, he's north of, of thirty. And I get, like I like I, we were talking, you know, of course, we have a text chain like most shows here. And like I sent you guys in the text chain when we talked about this, those super max deals for guys that are non superstars are poison pills. Like Bradley Beal's a good player. Like in a vacuum, if things were a little different, could you convince me that maybe Nick's go after him? Maybe right. I still have those issues with the defense, all that stuff. But once you bring in, I got to pay him $207 million over the next four years and the player option for the last year, um, which is at $57 million, like then the conversation ends. Like, I don't know why the teams sign these guys to these contracts. Like Teams are so afraid now of guys leaving that they end up kind of positioning themselves and putting them back in themselves in the corners where now it's going to be hard to get rid of these guys, especially yeah. after what happened with Rudy Gobert now. Now every team can look at that and say, I don't want to be the next – you know, Minnesota Timberwolves trading for a guy, giving up a million assets for a guy with a terrible contract. Well, I think that thinking from Washington's point of view is if they, they in other words, if he, they let him sign elsewhere last summer, they wouldn't have been able to use that cap space to sign a comparable player. So now the thinking is, at the time, we'll sign him to this right. contract. Worst case scenario, he demands a trade in 12 months, and then we'll trade him for a bunch of first-round picks. They may only get one first-round pick. Right. They may only get a one decent young player and some cap filler. But at least they get something as opposed to letting a guy walk for free. You could argue maybe a sign of trade would have been a more viable option. Um, so I think that's kind of where the Wizards were, were coming from. Um, but, yes, to your point – um, and, and again, something we've talked about again, the Knicks were a good offensive team last year, third right. in the NBA in, in offensive yeah. rating. Um, and they were 19th in the NBA in defensive rating. How does this move? Um, if it improves them offensively and no doubt, again, fans, I, I don't, I shouldn't say fans. folks sometimes, you know, think, okay, this guy's a great scorer. So if you, the, the object of the game is to score points, how can it make you, how can it not improve your team? It's because those shots take away from other shots. Are they more right. efficient shots? Do they prevent the other team from scoring more? Because again, the object of the game is not just to score more points. It's to score more points in your opponent. So if your right, opponent, exactly. if you give up more points on the other end of the floor, the net return may not be a, uh, positive so you know if you're asking me who i'd rather have og on an ob or bradley peel for the knicks it's not even a question you'd rather have that three and d wing um who's obviously not as good an offensive player as an ob but he's top 10 you know he's an old nba defender was a second team all nba ahead of guys like anthony davis and and, and Giannis antanacupo from the forward position um and, and you look at the guys he can guard you know beal can't do that same thing and then you talk about the usage rate assuming they don't send out valuable assets which mean they would keep both Randall and, and Barrett. Um, uh, maybe they would consider trading one of those. I'm not sure, but you know, maybe it's just cap filler and a draft pick or two. Uh, again, I, I wouldn't do any of the above, but let's say yeah. they can keep their valuable assets where they deem valuable assets, obviously Barrett and, and Randall among them. Then you, how are you going to split up shots between Bradley Beal, Jalen Brunson, RJ Barrett and, and Julius Randall, not to mention you got IQ and, and Josh Hart, you know, you're going to resign yeah. him. 
Um, so it's all for, for all those reasons. Again, that doesn't mean that Bradley Beal is a bad basketball player. It just means for the Knicks, especially at this stage of their development, all their young guys, all their, their young core, they've done a really good job of avoiding kind of those cap crippling contracts. Um, in order for me to take on one of those, I needed to be a stud type player and in bead type player those i'm willing to kind of give up the form for and risk that that contract but the, the ironic part is that that uh, in bead's contract is actually more team friendly than beal a lot of it has to do with when these deals are signed um but so when you factor in defensive issues um lack of success in the in, in with bradley beal on it uh, you know it, it, for the last few years of his career his lack of, of proven playoff credentials and then the cherry on the top that 200 million um hard pass for me yeah, and it's funny, you know, shout out to the people watching us on YouTube. Like, I'm looking at this lower third that we have for this video. You know, shout out to Alan Hahn, one of my favorite Nick commentators out there right now. So shout out to him. But, you know, it says Alan Hahn thinks Beal plus Brunson could be the NBA's best backcourt. You know who else I kept hearing about having the best backcourt with Bradley Beal? I kept hearing everybody say that Wall and Beal could be the NBA's best backcourt. What did that win them? Jack. It didn't win them anything. And like, those both guys in their prime. In their prime, not injured, not making $50 million a year. This was when they were young. They were making the playoffs and couldn't win anything. So, like, like okay, you had the best backcourt in the NBA. But, like, what does that mean towards actually winning? And I I just, I think, like, I feel like if they got Bradley Beal next season, I feel like the Knicks ceiling would be the same as it was this year. Like, if you're telling me, how, what do you think they would do next season? I'd say, I think they'll probably get to the second round. They compete in a hard fought series and they probably lose to the Bucks or Heat or right. Celtics. Like right. that's what I would think. So right. like if I, so I'm not gonna do that and then pay this guy fifty million dollars and hope yeah. that he stays healthy for the next four years. Again, if 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 Brunson was 31 and Randall was 32 and Barrett right. was 29. And then, you know, you, you, they're going to, you're going to lose those guys in free agency. You're going to have to, you know, kind of rebuild and reshuffle the deck. Like the, the Miami heat, I understand them being, you know, making that make sense. They've exactly. got Lowry's not getting any younger. Jimmy Bull is 34, 35 years old. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they're probably going to lose Gabe's uh, Gabe Vincent and, and Max true. So they have to replace those guys. Um, so again, they, their window obviously is Jimmy Butler focused. So Butler doesn't have, you know, five years left the Knicks they're the beauty of the Knicks con as currently constructed is not only are they competitive they made it to the grade eight this season but they are well positioned to be in the future in years past the Knicks didn't have anything you know worth so yeah trade for Bradley Beal and you can't get worse than a 17 win right, team exactly. anyway um right. you know but you know and then you have J Joe Kim Noah's contract with books and all this other nonsense that you didn't have a lot of you know maneuvering ability now you don't have to pick just that one lane you can as something we've said for weeks and months now you can be selective in the star you want to take back and this is not the, the right star that the Knicks should use those assets they've been accumulating to acquire in my opinion yeah no Bradley Beal I mean this is going to be a topic of conversation not just in Knicks world but in the NBA world he's a multiple time all-star he's a 25 point caliber scorer 30 point caliber scorer even a couple years ago he almost won it scoring title so he's gonna make an impact somewhere you would think if he goes to a contender but uh, I don't think it makes sense for the Knicks. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest podcast ventures. Um, links will be in the descriptions. And as always, thanks for watching and we will see you in our next video.